The mud sucked at my boots, a greedy hand trying to drag me down into that corpse-strewn field. Rotting flesh and a carrion stench swathed me like a burial shroud. My guts churned in revulsion, but I choked it back. To puke was to show weakness, and weakness was a death sentence. A raven croaked above me, its mockery mimicking the insults the men hurled my way. Coward, butcher, craven, traitor. It was true enough. I'd led the charge that shattered my brother's forces, cleaving through his elite guard to sink my axe in his breastbone. The cheers of victory still rang in my ears, tainted with guilt and an encroaching emptiness. The throne was mine now, but it reeked of betrayal. A hand clapped down on my shoulder, fingers thick and calloused. I knew that grip. Falk, my oldest lieutenant, and the only man left I even remotely trusted. Best survey the carnage, eh, your grace? He used the title like a curse, a bitter oath scraped from his throat. I followed his gaze, sweeping across the field. Crows feasted, their wet beaks glistening. Here and there, a spasm of motion betrayed the wounded, mere twitches among the unmoving heaps. Those still with enough life to writhe were the unlucky ones. The wolves will find them, I muttered. It was a kinder end than what I had in store. You couldn't let the injured linger. A knife in the ribs was a mercy, a way of ensuring they wouldn't rise again, spectral and vengeful. We'll need a pyre, Falk said. Gods know how many poxes fester among that lot. I nodded grimly. Plague was an ever-present threat, a creeping dread that lingered long after the swords fell silent. You burned the dead, no matter your faith, no matter their rank. It was simply how you survived. Leave me. My voice was hoarse. I need a moment. Falk hesitated, worry lines creasing his weathered face, but after a grunt of acknowledgement, he lumbered off, his heavy tread disturbing the fetid quietude of the battlefield. Alone, I could finally let the mask drop. Beneath the weight of steel and the newfound crown, I was just a man, sickened and reeling. My hands shook, the hands that had ended my own brother. He'd been weak, a fool unfit to rule. He would have driven our kingdom into ruin. I knew this, and yet there was a hollow ache within me that no victory could fill. This is what power was, I realized. Not triumph, but a brutal, ceaseless desolation. My reign had begun with a field of slaughter, and it would continue in fire and the ever-present shadow of betrayal. Night cloaked the ravaged field like a vast, suffocating veil. The pyre blazed, a monstrous bonfire against the darkness. Shadows devoured the corpses hauled towards the flames, the acrid stench of burning flesh a counterpoint to the lingering odour of death. Wordless, I surveyed the grim work. Soldiers prodded the fire with pikes, their soot-smudged faces eerily illuminated. Doubt assailed me. What if I was wrong? What if my brother had been the rightful leader? He was a fool! Falk's gruff voice shattered my thoughts. And you saved the kingdom! His weathered hand rested briefly on my shoulder, a weight both comforting and damning. The price a true ruler must pay, no one else had the stomach for it. A bitter laugh erupted from me. But I do! I gestured towards the pyre, towards the skeletal remains now collapsing into fiery embers. Does this make me a king or a monster? Falk's silence was an answer in itself. It was the question that would haunt me on sleepless nights, the question that clung like ash and smoke in the empty halls of the palace. The night was endless, filled with the crackle of the pyre and the howl of wind across the plain. The ghosts of the slain were restless, their hollow-eyed stares accusing. My dreams, when they came, were a maelstrom of faces contorted in hatred. My brothers among them. Dawn broke slowly, a grey stain against the cloud-choked sky. My men stirred, faces gaunt and strained. We were victors, yet it felt more like a curse than a blessing. They moved mechanically, their eyes hollowed by the horrors we had wrought. Back to the city, I said, my voice raw. There's much to do. What much entailed, I couldn't even bring myself to consider. 
my brother's loyalists would have to be purged, any dissent brutally crushed. There would be whispers, shadows, and knives concealed in the dark. Paranoia would be my constant companion, fear my most trusted advisor. The return journey was bleak and somber. The men marched with the weary gait of the damned, their battered armor a mockery of their once shining pride. We were butchers now, not heroes. As we passed smoldering villages and abandoned fields, an insidious guilt burrowed beneath my skin. The throne awaited, a cold, blood-soaked prize, won at a terrible cost. The capital greeted us not with cheers, but with shuttered windows and an oppressive silence. Fear hung thicker than the city smog. Even the ragged children lurking in the alleys seemed to sense the shift of power, their eyes wary and calculating. The palace loomed before me, an imposing edifice of shadowed arches and crumbling gargoyles, a tomb more than a home. I led my men through its corridors, their footsteps a discord against the unnatural hush. Falk broke the silence. My place is with the guard. Must weed out any snakes still lurking in the ranks. I gave him a curt nod. It was an unspoken truth. Suspicion would infect every interaction from now on. Old alliances were dust. My chambers awaited, opulent yet suffocating. Gold hangings and plush furnishings couldn't mask the smell. Stale blood lingered, an unseen stain against the extravagance. My brother's ghost seemed to mock me from every corner. A knock, timid but insistent, sounded against the ornate door. I braced myself. It couldn't be good news. A stooped figure entered, robed in drab grey. It was Maester Ulrich, the palace advisor, his roomy eyes filled with resignation and veiled cunning. Your grace, he wheezed with a shallow bow. It seems there are some pressing matters requiring your attention. Cut to the heart of it, old man, I snarled, exhaustion amplifying my irritation. The treasury, sire. It's bare. Your brother had a penchant for frivolous expenditures. Furthermore, the harvest was poor and... His voice trailed off. My fingers clenched against the carved armrest of my brother's throne. Starvation stalked the streets. Empty coffers meant disgruntled subjects, primed for revolt. My victory felt increasingly hollow. I was king of nothing but ash and ruin. Solutions, maester, not problems, I snapped. How do we fill the treasury? How do we feed the people? The advisor stroked his sparse beard with a trembling hand. Taxes must be raised, naturally. And perhaps a realignment of trade agreements with the neighbouring kingdoms, of course. That might incur certain... Obligations. Obligations. A knot tightened in my stomach. Alliances forged at the edge of a sword. Promises bought with threats and compromises. It was the ceaseless dance of power. As the maester droned on, my mind raced. This wasn't merely a kingdom. It was a tinderbox waiting for a spark. Poverty, resentment and whispers of my brother's supporters fueled it. And I, the usurper, was the one holding the match. Sleep was a fleeting visitor those first few nights. Nightmares stalked me. Dreams of battles turning against me. Of faceless mobs storming the palace. Of a bloodied crown slipping from my grasp. I'd wake in a cold sweat, heart pounding like a war drum, with the taste of betrayal souring my tongue. The days offered little respite. Audience chambers transformed into a snake pit. Weary peasants begged for bread I couldn't provide. Smug envoys from rival kingdoms eyed me with predatory interest, their smiles thinly veiled barbs. Under the guise of diplomacy, they sought weakness, a crack in the kingdom's brittle facade. Meister Ulrich became a constant, irritating presence, his wheezing voice rattling off endless lists, crop failures, rising dissent among the minor lords, tax revolts on the fringes of the realm. Each new report hammered another nail into the coffin of my naivete. Ruling wasn't valour on the battlefield, it was drowning in endless minutiae, navigating a sea of treacherous whispers. My temper shortened, my paranoia fueled by sleepless nights and relentless pressure. 
Courtiers flinched under my glare, apologies tumbling from their lips in a pathetic chorus. Only Falk remained unbowed, his blunt honesty a much-needed respite from the palace's toxic sycophancy. You're brooding like a gargoyle, your grace, he grunted one evening as we surveyed the city watch from the ramparts. This crown feels heavier than any helmet, I admitted, my voice a hoarse whisper against the wind. He chuckled mirthlessly. Welcome to the burden of rule. It breaks lesser men. And I? My hands clenched against the cold stone railing. Am I strong enough? Falk didn't answer directly. Instead, he gestured at the sprawling city below. Lanterns came to life like distant stars, illuminating the patchwork of hovels and palaces alike. All that is yours. Yours to protect. Yours to ruin. The responsibility, the sheer enormity of it all nearly crushed me. It was one thing to seize a throne in a righteous rage, and entirely another to preserve it. Send out scouts, I ordered. I need to know what lurks in the shadows, what plots ripen and where. And if we uncover dissent? Among the highborn, even? Falk's tone was laced with caution. A harsh smile twisted my lips. Then let them see what happens to those who dare defy their king. A few public executions should focus minds wonderfully. The old soldier hesitated, but concern in his eye was replaced by grim acceptance. It was the dawning of a new era. My era. It would be painted in the crimson of fear, stained with the tears of the disloyal. But through it all, I would cling to the power I'd claimed. Even if I had to become a monster to keep it. Each dawn seemed to arrive painted in shades of dread. Rumours twisted through the streets like vipers. Tales of midnight arrests. Of figures vanishing into the bowels of the dungeons. Of screams swallowed by the pre-dawn fog. My name was whispered with terror and a begrudging awe. The Butcher King they called me behind closed doors, yet even my detractors knew the streets were marginally safer now. Petty thieves and footpads hesitated before preying on the weak, deterred by the swift and merciless justice meted out by my guards. The executions, ah, yes, those were my masterstroke. I made spectacles of them. Not furtive hangings in back alleys, but public displays of pain and broken power. Treason did not flourish in the shadows. It needed to be uprooted and torn apart beneath the unforgiving sun. The scaffold became my stage. I'd watch as the condemned were dragged forth, their defiance swiftly dissolving into abject terror. The crowd, always, there was a crowd, held their breath. When the axe fell, a collective gasp would rise, followed by a ripple of fearful murmurs. A few would cheer, their voices hoarse with bloodlust. Others would avert their eyes, but the point was made. This was the fate of traitors. My court became a nest of subdued whispers and watchful eyes. I reveled in the discomfort, made a point of singling out those who flinched under my gaze. Every averted glance fueled a suspicion, and every suspicion warranted investigation. Folk's network of informants grew, their tendrils extending into taverns, brothels, and even the gilded halls of the aristocracy. Yet, the fear was a double-edged sword. While dissent was driven underground, so too was any semblance of loyalty. Even Falk, once my stalwart confidant, became guarded, his words measured. In the solitude of my chambers, the crown seemed to grow heavier with each passing day. I was no longer a warrior. I was a jailer, an executioner, and the ever-present eyes of my kingdom were the bars of my gilded cell. Sleep remained a fitful torment. More than once I woke with a strangled cry, the phantom sensation of my brother's hands upon my throat. My waking hours were no better. The walls seemed to close in, suffocating. Panic attacks plagued me. Ragged breaths, a pounding heart, a bone-deep certainty that the shadows were alive, waiting to consume me whole. To numb the dread, I turned to wine. At first it was a single goblet, a way to calm my nerves at the end of a brutal day, then it became a bottle. Soon I was rarely without a cup in my hand. 
It dulled the nightmares, softened the edges of the crushing responsibility. It was a treacherous comfort, a slow poison seeping into my veins, but in those hazy moments, it felt like salvation. My descent into wine-soaked oblivion was a slow and insidious one. What began as a means of self-preservation devolved into a dependency. The days merged together, a cycle of audiences punctuated by increasing numbness. Folk's words faded thinly through the haze, concerns muffled like far-off bells. When he was present, his gaze held a hint of disappointment I could no longer bear to acknowledge. The court became a cruel puppet show. Hollow-eyed advisers droned on while I struggled to focus on their interminable reports. I knew I reeked of stale wine, and their subtle grimaces were a constant mockery. It ignited a perverse defiance within me. If they judged, let them. My reign was built on blood, not their approval. Orders were barked out with increasing recklessness. Whims became decrees. Evenings devolved into drunken revels, with sounds of laughter filling the palace long past midnight. It was vulgar, yet perversely satisfying to see the masks of nobility slip, replaced by the desperate gaiety of the condemned. Meister Ulrich, the ever-present spectre, tried to navigate my mercurial swings, but his furrowed brow and pursed lips only stoked my ire. One evening, his hesitant protest about depleting funds was cut short by a wine cup flung at his head. He cowered, the shard catching his cheek and drawing a thin trickle of blood. You whimpering cur, are you questioning your king? My slurred words bounced against the high ceiling. The other courtiers scattered, their gazes skittering away from the scene. I reveled in their fear, in the knowledge that I was both master and monster. The next morning brought not regret, but rather a nagging irritation. My hands trembled, and the mere sight of light was enough to send shards of pain through my skull. Falk entered tentatively, his face an unreadable mask. Your grace. His voice was hesitant, edged with an unfamiliar strain. More news of ruin, yes? I snapped. News, yes, it concerns the northern lords. There's talk of... He faltered, the word rebellion hanging unspoken in the air. The threat beat at the base of my skull. A sobering, cold tendril of fear pierced the haze, reminding me that enemies were always circling. It was time to act. Time to shed the guise of the drunkard king and become the tyrant they whispered about. The butcher once more. A frigid clarity descended upon me, a stark contrast to the wine-induced fog that had consumed me. The threat of rebellion acted like a bucket of icy water, shocking me into a semblance of focus. Tell me everything, I commanded Falk, my voice sharpened into something resembling its old authority. His weathered face tightened. There are whispers in the north. Dissent. Their lords gather forces, angered by the taxes and... He hesitated. The executions? My knuckles whitened against the arms of the throne. So my reputation preceded me. Those northern brutes ever resistant to a new ruler. Yet a rebellion now, while my own court simmered with distrust, was an ill wind indeed. Ruthless suppression was the only answer. Rally the troops, I barked. We march at dawn. This uprising will be crushed before it can truly ignite. In the following days, the palace thrummed with activity, the clash of steel being readied, the gruff shouts of soldiers assembling, the whinnying of horses. As we marched north, the air grew colder, the landscape more barren. The weight of my sins seemed to bear down upon me, mirroring the relentless grey sky overhead. My crown felt like a band of thorns. The rebel stronghold loomed ahead. It was a symbol of the North's stubbornness, a mirror of my own iron will. The rebels would not simply surrender. They craved spectacle, a battle to make legends of. And so I would give it to them. Not a swift campaign, but a brutal display of my unyielding power. At first light we stormed the keep, 
There was no strategy, no subtle maneuvers, only a tidal wave of rage and steel. The rebels, caught off guard by the swiftness of our attack, fought with the desperate fury of the cornered. Yet, they were ill-prepared for the bloodlust of my troops, fueled by fear of their king and thirst for retribution. I rode into the fray, my axe cleaving through flesh and bone like hot iron through butter. The screams, the clash of metal, the blood spattering my armour. The battle was brutal, and I was in the thick of it. When the keep finally fell, there were no proud victors, only the exhausted and the slain. Corpses littered the battlements and courtyards, crows already descending upon them. I surveyed the carnage, a king amidst ruins, the stench of death clinging to me like a shroud. The rebellion was crushed, but as I stood among the twisted bodies, an inescapable truth settled within me. This was my legacy. Not valour, not progress, but a kingdom forged in blood and built upon ash. And I, the Butcher King, was its architect. The march back to the capital was a sombre affair. No triumphant songs, no banners unfurled. My army straggled along, more a funeral procession than a force returning from victory. I too shared their bleak demeanour. Crushing the rebellion had accomplished its goal, but the triumph felt sour in my mouth, a taste of rust and regret. The fear in the eyes of the remaining northerners was its own kind of accusation. I saw it in the averted gazes of villagers as we passed, in the way children were hastily pulled indoors at our approach. It was the fear not of a just ruler, but of a tyrant unbound. Each wary stare was a cut deeper than any blade. Even Falk's demeanour had shifted. His loyalty remained, but gone was the easy camaraderie of earlier days. A chasm had opened between us, born of the things I had become. He watched me, a silent question in his eyes, and I averted my gaze, unable to face his judgement. Upon returning to the palace, an oppressive silence blanketed the halls. Word of my brutality had preceded my arrival. Any lingering illusions of the righteous usurper taking his crown had been shattered, leaving only grim reality. My courtiers bowed low, eyes downcast. I hated them for it, yet I could not deny the truth reflecting in their gaze. The days bled into a monotonous haze of grim rule. Each decree, each report of taxes, squeezed mercilessly from the populace, further eroded my resolve. I had sought to save a kingdom, and instead had damned myself. Wine became my constant companion once again, but it no longer offered even the illusion of solace. It was a searing liquid, burning a path of self-loathing through my innards. My nightmares returned with renewed intensity, filled with spectral images of both my brother and the rebels I had slain. I would wake drenched in sweat, gasping for air, convinced that their accusing eyes were upon me even in the darkness. Meister Ulrich approached one morning, his ancient face showing concern. Your grace, he rasped, the treasury is strained. And with winter approaching, his voice trailed off, famine would stalk my kingdom, and I had no solutions. Leave me, I hissed, the goblet trembling in my grip. He bowed with a sad whisper of, as you wish, and retreated, leaving me to drown in my failures. I was alone in my monstrous grandeur. The crown, once so coveted, was now a leaden weight upon my brow. The throne, a seat built of the bones I'd shattered. And I, the Butcher King, remained its prisoner, trapped in the gilded cage of my own making. Winter descended upon the kingdom like a death shroud. Ice coated the streets, and the chill seeped into the very heart of the palace. Fires burned ceaselessly in my chambers, and yet the cold bit at my bones with a persistence no flame could quell. My wine-soaked sleep became a series of fitful shivers, my dreams plagued by skeletal figures reaching for me with frozen, accusing hands. The capital was a spectre of its former self. The once vibrant markets lay abandoned, food stalls empty save for a few withered scraps. 
beggars huddled in doorways, their gaunt faces a bleak indictment of my rule. Rumours swelled, carried on the frigid wind, curses whispered against my name, plots muttered in desolate corners. With each passing day, the chasm within me widened. One part clung to the ruthless pragmatism that had kept me alive, a ruler willing to do what was necessary for survival. Yet now, a dreadful realisation sank in, that even such cruelty could not save me from this encroaching abyss. Falk remained steadfast, but even his eyes reflected the kingdom's decay, the dimming hope. One bleak morning I found him studying a map. His finger traced a path northward, beyond my domain's borders. We must prepare your grace, he said, his voice rough with suppressed concern. Famine will drive the people to desperation. Riots, perhaps worse. I stared at that map, at the uncharted territories beyond. A mad thought took root, to flee, to become a spectre haunting the ruins of my legacy. A small, shameful part of me yearned for the coward's escape, but the cold weight of the crown anchored me with grim finality. That night, as a blizzard rattled the palace windows like skeletal fingers, I made my decision. Meister Ulrich was summoned, his frail form a shadow against the monstrous hearth. Prepare the hemlock, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. The old man went deathly pale. Your grace! He choked out. Do it before I change my mind! I snarled, the remnants of my strength lashing out against the weakness I despised. When the cup was brought, I studied the murky liquid. It was salvation of a sort, a way to escape the judgment I bore within. I drank it with steady hands, the bitterness mirroring my ruined soul. As the poison coursed through me, I watched the shadows cast by the fire. They seemed to twist and writhe, no longer spectres of the past, but heralds of the oblivion to come. I found a grim satisfaction in this, in this final act of control. The Butcher King would not die kneeling at the hands of his subjects, nor would he wither away under the weight of his failures. He would meet his end on his own terms, and in the ashes of my pyre perhaps a wiser ruler could rise. Years passed, turning decades. The Butcher King became a cautionary tale, a dark stain upon the kingdom's history. The poison chalice left no heir, leading to a chaotic struggle for power. The warlords and petty lords, once held in check by iron-fisted rule, ravaged the land. Alliances formed and shattered like brittle ice, and the scars of civil war added a fresh layer of desolation to the landscape. It was Falk, the loyal soldier, who emerged from the chaos. Weary with bloodshed, yet hardened by a lifetime of service, he rallied the remnants of the royal army and beat back the opportunists. His rule was pragmatic, focused not on grand visions, but on the desperate task of survival. Taxes were eased where possible, trade routes cautiously reopened, and a semblance of order clawed its way back into the ravaged realm. Yet, Falk was no saviour, he bore the cynicism of a man who had witnessed the worst humanity had to offer. Justice was swift and brutal, rebellion swiftly crushed before it could blossom. Though he wore no crown, his hand was as heavy as any king's, born of necessity, and he was called Iron Fist behind his back. Time did little to heal the wounds of the kingdom. Winters remained harsh, and harvests were meagre on soil depleted by conflict. The grand palaces built in eras of excess crumbled, their stones reclaimed by peasants to build meagre hovels. The spectre of famine was a constant companion, a low, steady threat lingering behind every lean season. In the history scrolls, in the faded records kept by dwindling orders of maesters, the tale of the Butcher King was never erased. It existed as a grim reminder a fable about the monstrous heart ambition could carve within a man. New rulers, young and sometimes foolish, would read the accounts of his rise and fall, a chill settling over them. Perhaps some learned from it. Perhaps a few faltering hands on the reins of power tightened with caution, and a few acts of cruelty were tempered, their shadows retreating ever so slightly.